Welcome back to the Data Professor YouTube channel. If you're new here, my name is Chenin Nanta Senaman, and on this YouTube channel, we cover about data science concepts and practical tutorials. So if you're into this kind of content, please consider subscribing. So a week ago on January 1st of this year, 2020, you might have noticed that I've shared a infographic entitled a one page summary of the machine learning model building process on the Data Professor Facebook. And I've also made available on the Figshare. And so if you click on it, you will see a one page summary infographic. And so I posted this one page infographic on some of the Facebook groups, and it has received wide interest as there were more than 100 likes. And so this gave me an idea of why don't I make a video about the machine learning model process. And so thus this video is born. Okay, so let's begin. So you can go to the Facebook fan page of the data professor. So type in facebook.com slash data professor. And if you haven't yet liked this page, please go ahead and like the page. Please also follow the page and also please share it to your friends who you think would be interested in data science. And so you can click on this link by scrolling down a bit and then click on the fixture link and then you will come to this page and then you could click and download the infographic here. And so this is the infographic. So let's zoom in and let's talk about the machine learning model process. Okay, so let's begin. So in every data mining or data science project, you will start with your initial data set, right? Your data set could be structured or unstructured. Your data set could be numerical. It could be what quantitative, qualitative, right? The data set could be clean, meaning that it will be having no missing values, or it could also have missing values presented in the data set. And so therefore you will have to clean the data set, pre-process the data set, curate the data set. And also oftentimes the variables might be redundant and therefore you have to perform some sort of feature selection, right? And in order to get a rough understanding of your data set, you have to do data understanding and you can do that by performing exploratory data analysis by using PCA or principal component analysis, self-organizing map. And you can also use basic statistics like looking at the distribution, looking at the scatter plot of the variables, looking at the histograms, looking at the minimum, maximum values, the standard deviation, the mean value, the median, the mode, right? The standard statistical approach. Okay, so once you have cleaned the data, curate the data, remove any redundant features, primarily when it has low standard deviation values, right? Like variables that are useless will have very low or zero standard deviation value. So in some of the project that we do, we also set like if the standard deviation is less than 0 0.01, we're going to delete that variable. And you can also implement something similar in order to remove constant variables or variables that are useless. And so the data set will essentially look like this, right? You have the input variables and then you have the output variables. Your output variable could be either quantitative or qualitative. So that is if you have an output variable. But if you don't have an output variable, then you're going to only have the input variable, right? So the selection of a suitable learning algorithm, we're going to cover that in just a moment. Okay, so once you have your pre-processed data set, you might be ready to start the data data mining process, but not just yet. So the thing is, will you use all of your data set? So oftentimes it's more economical if you could subset the data set into a smaller unit that you think would be relevant to answer your hypothesis. So let's say that if you talk to your stakeholders or you talk to the people who are relevant, who wanted you to develop the model in the first place, then come to an agreement on what is the scope of the prediction model, right? So let's say that you want to develop a prediction model for people who are age 60 and above. So your data set will have to be filtered in such a way that you're going to use age greater than 60 as a filter, right? And then if age is less than 60, you're not going to use, right? So you're going to subset the data so that age is greater than 60. So that will significantly reduce the number of rows, the quantity, the volume of your data set, right? So subsetting your data set depending on the stakeholders input. Okay, so once 
once you have the data set that you want to use, then you want to split your data set into two portions. So one portion you want to use as the training set and another portion you want to use as the testing set. So a good number to use would be 80-20. So why 80-20? Well, it's just an arbitrary number and according to the Pareto's principle 80-20. So in the Pareto's principle, 80% of the effort will account for 20% of the productivity, or 80% of the world's GDP will be accounted by 20% of the world's country. 80% of the profit are coming from 20% of the company's products. Okay, so it's just an arbitrary number that we use to create our training set and testing set, which is the 80-20%. So we're going to use the 80% to create the training set and we're going to use the 20% to use as the test set. Okay, so now let's come to the selection of the learning algorithms. So I'm sure there's a lot of algorithms available out there and the fanciest algorithm and most popular algorithm thus far right now is deep learning. Okay, so the thing is, do you require deep learning in order to develop your model? Maybe or maybe not. Maybe a more simple model might be more suitable for your data set. So the thing is, you might want to try more simple models before you invest into deep learning because deep learning will consume high compute cost. So if you could use a more simple approach to model your data set, then you could try that first and then you could work your way up. Okay, so the selection of the learning algorithm will be dependent on whether you have the output variable or not, which is one of the criteria. Because in learning algorithms, you have supervised learning and unsupervised learning. So with supervised learning, it means that you have an output variable that you want to predict. And so that's supervised learning. It's like you have a teacher who will teach the students. Right? So the output variable will be teaching the algorithm to learn how to classify the data objects based on the output variable. Right, and then the, the error will then adjust the parameters, etc., until we have a predictive model that can accurately predict the output variable. Okay, so, in supervised learning, you have the output variables. And what if you don't have an output variable? Then you could use unsupervised learning. And typically, unsupervised learning are algorithms such as PCA, SOM, right, the principal component analysis, self organizing map. Right, so, these are popular unsupervised learning approaches. And so, with supervised learning approaches it is for most of the project that we are doing in our research program and so with the supervised learning approaches there are quite a lot right support vector machine deep learning gbm gradient boosted machines k nearest neighbor decision trees random forest right we like random forest and decision tree a lot because it allows us to interpret the important underlying features by means of the gini index okay so learning algorithm selection is dependent on which algorithm will be able to do classification and regression, right? So for a supervised learning, you have the output variable and then the output variable will be suitable for classification or regression will depend on whether it is a numeric or a qualitative value. So if it's a numerical or quantitative value, then you could use regression. But if it is a categorical or qualitative label, then you're going to use the classification, right? And the classification could be binary class class classification or it could be multi-class right support vector machine could handle both regression and classification deep learning as well gbm decision tree random forest okay so that's part of the learning algorithm and now let's hop on to this concept of hyper parameter optimization so every learning algorithm will have parameters that you can adjust in order to improve its accuracy. Like for example, in random forest, you could adjust the M try and also the entry parameters. Support vector machine, you, you could adjust it by deciding on whether it will be a linear machine, a polynomial kernel, a radial basis function kernel, and also the C parameter and the gamma parameter, and also the epsilon value. And you could do this hyper parameter optimization in a grid wise manner, right? And also you could do some form of feature selection in order to further reduce the features that you use during the modeling process. But for approaches like random forest, it has a built in feature selection. And so typically we don't have to do any form of feature selection, just use the whole entire feature 
structure that are containing information, meaning that we have already removed the redundant features. Okay, so let's talk about how we're going to use the training set. We're going to use the training set to create the trained model, and we're also going to use it for creating the cross validation model, right? So in the cross validation, it essentially will partition or separate the data set of this training set into n fold, right? If you specify n to be 10, then it will separate it into 10 fold. If you specify it to be five, it will separate it into five fold. Fold would mean partition. So each partition will have roughly same number of data samples. So let's say that you have 150 iris flower. So if you have a 10 fold cross validation, each fold will contain 15 flowers. And so 15 random flowers will be assigned to each of the 10 partition. And in one iteration, one partition will be left out and the remaining nine partition will be used to create the prediction model. And then the prediction model will be applied to the left out partition. And so that concludes iteration one. And then the next iteration will then take the left out partition, move it back in and take a new partition out and then use the remaining nine to create a prediction model and then apply the prediction model to predict the values of the left out partition. And so we're going to do this over and over again until each partition will be left out at least one time. And then, and then the prediction accuracy will be averaged over the 10 iterations. Okay, so that's the cross validation. Okay, so once we use the training set to develop the trained model, the trained model could be used to predict the Y values, right? The trained model could be used to predict the Y values of the training set and also of the test set. Okay, and so once it makes the prediction, so depending on whether it is a classification or a regression problem, the model evaluation will have different metric. So regression has metrics such as R squared, mean squared error, root mean squared error. And for classification models, it has metrics such as accuracy, sensitivity, specificity, and the Matthews correlation coefficient, right? And based on the basis of these classification metrics or regression, performance metrics, you would then decide whether your prediction is valid or is it robust enough. If it is, you can decide whether to deploy your model by talking to your stakeholders. And if you are ready to deploy your model, then please refer to our other videos on how you can deploy your machine learning model. Okay, and so this is the one page summary of the machine learning model building process made into a video. And so comments down below on whether you would like to see more of this type of video. And if you would like to, what kind of topics that you would like to see. And I'm currently working on a infographic about how to handle missing data. And I might create a video out of that as well. And also it's going to be part of the data pre-processing in R series where we will have many videos covering about different aspects on how you can pre-process process your data set. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, and share, and I'll see you in the next one. But in the meantime, please check out these videos.